Hello, I'm Jim Clifford, a professor in the history department. I'm an environmental historian of London. Uh, it's industrialization, it's urban growth, and how it connected to other parts of the world in the 19th century. So there's three parts to my lecture today. I'm going to uh, quite quickly give you an overview of the size and scale of London in 1900 and how it compared to cities in the rest of the world. And then I will move on to a, a look at London's industry and some of its global connections and then follow or finish off with a bit more of an in-depth look at one factory, the factory we see in the background here, John Knight and Sons Soap Factory in Silvertown on the eastern edge of London. So today, cities over 5 million people are quite common. There's uh, cities over 10 million people on every continent and numerous cities over 5 million, including one in Canada, Toronto. But in 1900, there was only one city uh, at this scale, and it's the, it was the first city to ever reach 1 million people in history. During the 19th century, a number of other cities in Europe grew past a million people. And as you can see, Paris uh, gets beyond 3 million people by 1900. But London is still significantly larger than all of its competitors, both in the rest of Europe, uh, but also New York or other cities in uh, the United Kingdom like Manchester or Glasgow. By the standard of its day, it was also uh, more geographically expansive than other cities. Paris was still largely hemmed in by a series of defensive walls uh, and different regulations. In some cases, other cities uh, struggled with geographic constraints like the major rivers that flow through New York. But London could kind of grow in all directions with just the Thames flowing through the middle of it. But if we contrast London with Saskatoon today, we can still see that it was relatively small for a city of 5 million people. It was larger than Saskatoon, but Saskatoon only has 300,000 people. London was growing towards 6 million people uh, by this point in time, and it's only somewhat larger. So first, let's think a little bit about what it's like to live in a city of 5 million people compressed into a relatively small space. Uh, what it meant was a lot of families lived uh, with three or four families in a house built for one family. There was some dense tenement buildings that we can see in the photographs here, uh, but mostly uh, Londoners lived in housing closer to the, the housing in the bottom corner uh, that was just spread out across uh, the suburbs with two or three families living in each uh, relatively small house. This created lots of sanitary challenges. London was one of the first cities to have a major sewer system that carried away human waste by pipe uh, and dumped it downstream. But when you have four families sharing one water closet, normally located in the, the backyard of the property, uh, of course, nothing, it was very difficult to keep everything clean and sanitary at all times. And this led to lots of challenges with infectious disease uh, spreading through the population, and particularly uh, challenging for children who, who died at relatively high numbers compared to today, over one in 10 children didn't make it to their first birthday. London was different from a lot of other cities in Britain because of its kind of wide spectrum of wealth and poverty and how it actually kind of mixed together uh, in close geographic proximity. So London had the richest aristocrats and factory owners and bankers uh, living in central parts of, of London, uh, and it had the poorest people in the country. 
living. And as we can see in this map created by a philanthropist named Charles Booth, who surveyed the London population in, in part trying to uh, discredit the socialists who were critiquing the levels of poverty in the city, uh, he sort of surprised himself finding that about a third of the population was living in, in something close to abject poverty. But not only that, they were living in close proximity to the middle class and even the upper class. Uh, in this map, the red hues are the wealthier people, especially the uh, red and, and light red. And then the dark uh, blue and black are the most impoverished people. And you can see uh, the close proximity between the two throughout South London here. London had a mixed economy, which is also something that made it distinct from Manchester, Liverpool, Leeds, Glasgow, these major cities uh, in the industrial heartland in the north. Uh, it had the governments that not only uh, ruled Britain itself, but also the empire that I think you learned about last week uh, that spread across the globe. It had uh, the heart of the global banking system, the stock markets. It had hundreds and hundreds of small workshops, uh, an expansive service economy, but also heavy industry, as you can see this uh, Thames Ironworks shipyard building a large dreadnought class battleship uh, in East London. And in addition to that, you have the docks uh, with thousands of people working in the port of London, unloading and loading ships that connect London and uh, Southern England with the rest of the world. So that was a very quick introduction to uh, London's scale and I could talk at length about the social and political history of the city as it grappled with all the challenges that came with such a large population and a, a population that stretched from the, the very richest to the very poorest. But today I want to focus in on, on some of its global connections and how industry in particular was connected to other parts of the globe. And of course, I, I could also talk about the, the connections between British finance and banking and uh, other parts of the globe. British bankers uh, had huge influence in South America, for example, but I'm going to focus on, on these factories that you can see in this map that I created with some students over the, the past few years working here at the University of Saskatchewan, where we tried to identify all the factories that we could find in uh, high resolution maps of London in 1895. So here's an example of two of the factories we find on the maps and, and the detail that we get from this really rich source uh, showing us London's industry uh, and London's built environment more generally. So over the next few minutes, I'm just gonna show you a, a handful of these, some of the kind of key factories that linked up uh, London with other parts of the world and, and some of the ways uh, that those connections developed. So starting with Tate and Sons Sugar Refinery in Silvertown on the eastern edge of London. This is a factory that particularly specialized in making cubed sugar. Uh, the British loved very sweet tea uh, as, as sort of one of their main uh, parts of their diet, providing not just calories, but also the caffeine stimulus. Uh, and for people working very long hours in factories and shops, uh, this is a pretty crucial part of their diet and culture. By the end of the 19th century, the global uh, refi unrefined sugar supply had really diversified. If, if we jump back a century or so earlier, we find the vast majority of the sugars coming from the Caribbean with some coming from uh, the Indian subcontinent. But you can see in 1895, uh, the sugar supply is much more diverse with still some coming from Jamaica, but also from Brazil and other parts of South America, from Egypt, from India, from Java and the Philippines, 
but also this new uh, competing supply of sugar. Uh, they're not just bringing in sugar cane from all those locations anymore, but you now have sugar beets coming from Germany and other parts of Central Europe and France as a new kind of major competitor. Although I believe the Henry Tate factory uh, continued to mostly use sugar cane for its raw material. So focusing on Jamaica for just a moment, uh, this is a really kind of interesting place in the British Empire. We're now uh, almost 75 years after the end of slavery uh, in the British Empire, uh, but it's still a colony of Britain. It still has mostly European or British ownership of the sugar plantations. And historians of racism in the British world actually kind of look at this post-slavery period as a place where some of the uh, worst racist ideas formed uh, and, and kind of spread from Jamaica out to other parts of the British world with a, a real kind of uh, intense uh, dismay for the unwillingness of Jamaican Africans to continue to work on the plantations. And this created a discourse of laziness amongst uh, this African uh, Jamaican population. But of course, if we look at it from the uh, ex-slave and their descendants perspective, uh, of course they didn't wanna work doing backbreaking uh, labor on sugar plantations for very low wages when they were able to grow food on their own land holdings that fed their families, uh, allowed them to be productive, allowed them to engage directly in, in uh, barter and market economy uh, instead of uh, relying on wages and the poverty that they brought. So historians have explored this in, in kind of much greater detail than I can discuss today, but it's still this kind of interesting connection where the supply chains uh, for the British to continue to consume large quantities of sugar in their diet uh, also had these ripple cultural and social effects and helped spread a, a new kind of deeper form of racism in the second half of the 19th century than the racism that existed during the period of slavery in the 18th and early 19th century. Uh, this is the only factory that I'm going to discuss today that still exists. The vast majority of London's industry declined after the Second World War. Uh, much of it was blown up during the Blitz, but uh, it also experienced just all kinds of challenges from later periods of globalization. Sugar refineries are, seem to be one uh, industry that are really resistant to, to globalization. They're still uh, kind of an economic reason to produce sugar locally. So moving on to the neighbor, we have a really key location in the British Empire, the India Rubber, Gutta Percha and Telegraph Works. Gutta Percha is this really interesting product that we've now almost entirely forgotten about that's just crucial uh, to the expansion of the British Empire during the 19th century. Because gutta percha is the material that makes underwater telegraph cables possible. Uh, in many ways, it's very similar to rubber. It's the resin extracted from a tropical tree that forms a rubber-like material. The big difference is that rubber breaks down very quickly in salt water, uh, while gutta percha does not. So it's a crucial insulation to the underwater telegraph cables during the uh, later half of the 19th century and it allows the British Empire as you see in this red map in, in the bottom uh, to be sort of fully connected together by the end of the 19th century. Uh, it also makes a uh, better golf ball than rubber but that's not nearly as crucial to the, the uh, global functioning of the British Empire. Gutta Percha is sourced from the Malay Peninsula and nearby islands, so modern day Malaysia and, and its neighbors are the main source of gutta Percha. But unlike rubber, 
attempts to grow plantations of gutta percha fail. So merchants instead rely on the indigenous people of the Malay Peninsula to harvest uh, this resin from the trees that are cut down. And as much of the resin is extracted, but they're using fairly simple hand tools. So historians now estimate that the vast majority of the gutta percha just ended up rotting in the, the forest floors. Um, this created a, a crisis towards the end of the 19th century because the global demand uh, reached a point where they were cutting down the vast majority of the gutta percha trees. They weren't being allowed to regenerate uh, and it was completely unsustainable. And uh, the invention of an artificial latex that could survive saltwater conditions uh, managed to save the global telecommunication systems, but it was too late to really save the gutta percha species and it, it was devastated uh, in the second half of the 19th century. Next, I wanna talk briefly about the leather industry. You can see uh, an ex there is an extensive network or cluster of leather factories in South London. This dates back to the 18th century. Uh, but the one I'm going to talk to you about today is Bevington and Sons, uh, one of the larger tanneries that focused on making kind of high quality uh, leather from thinner skins used for things like book binding. And you can see here along the right some of the examples that I found in an old uh, book in the British Library of the seal goat, and I think the bottom one is a pig leather. So this factory uh, relies on a, a kind of astoundingly global uh, supply of skins. You can see on the left here that goat skins are coming from India, Aden, North Africa, uh, continental Europe, Russia, South Africa, and then sheepskins are coming from Argentina, huge quantities coming from uh, Cape of Good Hope in South Africa, New Zealand, Australia. And then in addition to these domesticated animals, uh, they relied on British North America, primarily the, the area around Newfoundland, to supply huge quantities of seal skins from wild animals. So you can see in, in, I think this is 1895, uh, they're harvesting 347, 711 seal skins and pelts uh, from British North America alone, with more coming from South America, Europe, and other parts of the world. Uh, a few years later, there's a massive harvest of seal skins from uh, the Bering Straits. So they're going great distances all the way to the uh, western edge of Alaska to supply seal skins for the British leather industry. In addition to skins and hides for the leather industry, they also needed tannins. Uh, locally, they'd originally mostly used oak bark, but there was a severe shortage of oak bark by the end of the 19th century. So they went looking for other products that could tan leather. Uh, for the book binding, uh, they'd traditionally been using sumac which comes from mostly Sicily and other parts of southern Italy. Uh, and this product is again relied on uh, to make this scale of leather production possible. So finally, I want to spend a little bit more time uh, looking at one factory in particular, one company uh, in a series of factories. Uh, this is something that I've recently published an article about. Uh, and I spent too many years of my life trying to understand all the intricacies of the, the global supply chains that made this factory possible. So John Knight and Sons, John Knight gets into the soap factory in the late 1820s and, and or soap industry in the late 1820s and builds his first factory in the 1830s. Uh, he's at the kind of cutting edge of this transition in soap production from proto-industrial scale where you can see in this uh, print from Holland that most soap in the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century uh, 
is made uh, in small workshops with one soap pan where a, a small team uh, mix, stir, and then pour the soap into cakes. Uh, it's a lower quality than modern soap. Uh, they don't get the uh, balance uh, perfect between the chemicals. Uh, and it's obviously made at a much smaller scale. Uh, this wood cutting shows us uh, the significant increase in scale. This is the first John Knight and Sons factory in Wapping in East London. And you can see here at least four vats uh, that are considerably larger than the, the small pots at the workshop scale, producing not just uh, a higher quantity of soap, but now a higher quality of soap. They, un they understand the chemistry a lot better and they can produce a soap with a balanced pH where they're actually extra extracting the, the glycerin, which becomes a, a key byproduct to supply uh, the war industry for uh, modern gunpowder and explosives. Uh, but primarily they're making soap, uh, they're making high quality soap and they're making it in huge quantities. And the factory, uh, they soon outgrow it, or not soon, but by the 1870s they outgrow it. And we have a photograph here of the new factory in Silvertown, so not too far from the sugar refinery and the, the telegraph uh, cable production facility. Uh, we have this very large multi-story uh, industrial facility producing two to 300 tons of soap in a week. Uh, that's about as much soap as all of London was producing uh, in about 1830 when John Knight got into the business. So now one factory uh, is, is producing uh, the equivalent soap of the whole city a few decades earlier. Uh, they're consuming huge quantities of tallow and cotton seeds. Uh, cotton seeds, the story is pretty simple. They're almost entirely a byproduct of the cotton industry in Egypt, uh, which is one of the main suppliers of Britain's uh, textile industry. Uh, but tallow is a lot more interesting because it shifts from uh, the Russian Empire to Argentina and the United States and eventually to Australia. So exploring why and how those shifts happen over the course of the 19th century became a big focus for my research over a number of years. So turning to British trade statistics, we can see uh, the growing supply of tallow, mostly from Russia through to the 1840s, and then uh, a small uh, increase in the amount of tallow coming from mostly Argentina and the United States during these uh, early years of competition in the 1850s and 60s. And then we can see that Russia really declines after 1866 uh, and uh, begins competing with other parts of the world. So this left me with my first big question in this research. Why, what explains the collapse of Russian tallow? They've been the major suppliers of tallow to Western Europe since the 17th century. Uh, they've been dominant through the 18th and early 19th century. Uh, so what changes. The, the Russian tallow is mostly coming from the Eurasian steppe, from Kazakh people with huge herds of sheep and cattle. They would bring them to the edge of the Russian Empire where there was large boiling down uh, operations. Uh, you know, unfortunately, most of these animals were, were killed just for their skins and their tallow. Uh, you couldn't preserve the meat effectively. There wasn't much mar market for low quality salted meat. So all they were able to do was to kill tens of thousands of sheep and cattle uh, and then put them into large pots and boil them off, uh, scooping the tallow into barrels and then processing the skins. And those could be transported long distances to cities like Amsterdam and London and Western Europe that uh, wanted to make more soap and candles and leather products than their local uh, supply from the butchers could support. So what explains the collapse of Russian tallow? Well, it turned out there was sort of a uh, multi-factors that 
that led to this collapse. First of all, you do have the Crimean War in the 1850s. So even though that doesn't immediately lead to a, a significant drop in Russian exports, uh, it does stimulate South American and Austri Australian uh, tallow production. They see it as an opportunity uh, and it kind of gets the industry started in these countries, even if it takes them a few more decades to really be competitive. And then in the 1860s, first of all, you have Rinderpest, uh, which kills a large number of cattle in particular uh, across Europe and in Russia. Uh, and you also have uh, new tariffs on British imports that made it uh, less economical to transport tallow because the ships would be traveling all the way to uh, Russia empty and would have to account for that cost uh, bringing the tallow back. Uh, but in addition to that, you also have increased demand uh, from an increasingly wealthy economy in Russia and a more industrialized economy. So you have candle and soap factories buying the tallow and using it locally instead of shipping it overseas. And you have the colonization and settlement of the steppe, a very similar pattern uh, that we're probably familiar with here in Saskatchewan where the Great Plains in the United States of European settlers arriving and uh, changing a grassland into uh, wheat fields. Uh, the same thing basically happens uh, on the uh, eastern edge of Russia with European settlers coming in and transforming this grassland into uh, wheat fields uh, during these same decades of the 1880s and 1890s. Uh, so there's a significant reduction in the uh, sheep and cattle herds on the Eurasian steppe, uh, reducing the supply of tallow. So returning to this chart of all of the tallow imports, the next big question that stands out is what happens with Australia to cause this huge surge of tallow in the 1890s? And this question took me too many years uh, to figure out because all of the sources that I looked at at first, including trade journals about the soap and uh, candle industry published out of London, just didn't seem to have the answer. And I didn't have the time or money to fly to Australia. Uh, the first answer that I got talking to some Australian uh, colleagues of mine is that it probably had something to do with the Federation drought that uh, gets started in 1895, really gets going in 1896. Uh, this drought is devastating to the agricultural economy and it's one of the major factors that helps drive uh, these colonies into a federation um, and, and to become a single country of Australia at the beginning of the 20th century. But the timeline, as you can see here, doesn't quite add up. There's this surge of tallow coming out of Australia before uh, the drought starts a few years later. I finally found that Australia has digitized almost all of its regional newspapers and I was able to start searching through these newspapers and uh, the answer is relatively simple once I finally had the right source to try and answer it. Uh, basically, the sheep farmers realized that they were due for a drought. There had been very good weather uh, in the late 1880s and the early 1890s, and the population of sheep was uh, close to double what they knew they'd be able to maintain once a drought started. So with a bit of foresight, they started building uh, factories on the edge of rail lines where they could start processing uh, thousands and thousands of sheep um, before a drought came and uh, at least get some value out of that uh, process by selling the, um, the skins, the tallow, and some canned meat uh, in the British market before the, the drought left them with just fields of uh, dead animals. So here I'm going to conclude uh, 
just by reflecting that the 19th century in the 19th century global connections were not limited to the expansion of empires trade networks both within and outside of formal empires brought an increased proportion of the globe's forests fields and the people that worked lived and uh, cultivated them into global exchange for me, these global connections are at least as important and maybe more important than the technological innovations of the second industrial revolution. So this kind of uh, second process that's happening alongside the new chemical uh, innovations and uh, electricity uh, and internal combustion engines in the second industrial revolution, the ability for these core industrial economies to reach out to the rest of the globe and find the raw materials they need to produce uh, all these new goods and services and to feed their growing populations is really crucial to understanding this point in history. Uh, the British do this better than anybody else, although the Germans uh, and other European countries in the uh, United States are also growing globally connected economies. Uh, this makes the British wealthier, at least the wealthy British wealthier than anyone else in the world, but it also makes them more susceptible to submarine warfare a decade and a half later when the First World War comes and Britain is really uh, in a challenging position because it's so reliant on global supply chains, not just to feed its population, but also to supply its industry and make all the war material that are necessary uh, to, to fight its war uh, against Germany between 1914 and 1918. So that's just a little bit of foreshadowing for what's coming up in this course, uh, but uh, just trying to demonstrate uh, maybe some different perspectives on European history and the importance of paying attention to how environment and economy uh, work together across the globe uh, to bring these kind of crucial connections. Uh, thanks a lot and have a good day.